Hi everybody, welcome back to the DevOps Lab. I'm Damien. Today I am joined by Todd. Todd, what are we talking about? We've been talking about testing your systems for confidence and using monitoring to understand what you can't test. Awesome. It's important stuff. Don't miss it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the DevOps Lab. I'm Damien, I'm joined today by Todd. Todd, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. Excellent. So we are recording this at Kansas City DevConf. We are. Um, and you are the founder of TrackJS, right? I am. Which is JavaScript production monitoring. Yes, JavaScript error monitoring for production apps. We, awesome. uh, we tell you when your JavaScript fails in the production oh, environment for the real users. Awesome. I, my JavaScript fails all the time. Well, most JavaScript fails all the time. That's why it's JavaScript. Right. Yeah. Good. So your your session uh, at KCDC this year is on uh, production failure, testing failures in production or something? Yeah, yeah. I did a talk today about um, different projects that I've been on over my career and how each of them has approached testing and how they might have failed or not did something completely right as part of that, and that led to the, the failure of that project. Right. OK. So testing is... We would traditionally think about this as a thing that we do when we're writing our code. We run our tests. If we're doing DevOps properly, we do it in the pipeline to make sure that our tests all pass before it goes into production. But then when it's in production, like the testing stops, right? Because <laughs> we've tested it. Well, ki I mean, kind of. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people do stop testing. But I mean, the ultimate goal of testing our software to begin with is to get confidence that it's going to do what we think it's going to do, right? right? That we trust that we can we can pull it down, and we can compile it, and we can run it, and the users can do it, and it does what we think it does. Uh -huh. And testing gives us confidence that all those things are true. But when it goes out into production, things happen, right? Especially yeah. in like a web app kind of thing, because you're probably not using the same browsers that your customers are doing. You're not operating over the same networks. You're not doing things in exactly the same order that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so testing gives you a high degree of confidence, but it, not gives you, it doesn't give you all of it. Right. And so monitoring layers on top of testing, giving you this insight about like, here's what's really happening in your application. Okay. And it's like testing what the user is actually doing when they're actually doing it. And so it's this important feedback loop into your applications to say, here's the things that maybe our testing missed. Like, oh crap, you know, this thing keeps blowing up on uh, Safari Mobile or whatever. Oh, we right. should add that to our testing cycle to make sure that that works. And is that is that an important part of it? If something does fail in production, making sure that that doesn't happen again or that, that you have covered that now? I think it's important that when something blows up in production, you address it one way or another. So okay. like something can blow up in production and and it might not be a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. It might be like, oh yeah, like we don't really support IE8 anymore. It does, it, whatever, it doesn't okay. matter. But you should be forced to like recognize that, oh crap, the system blows up in IE8 and intentionally ignore those kind of rules or intentionally hide those kind of locks or whatever yeah. so that they're not just cluttering your your otherwise valuable data stream, right? Yeah. Because yeah. when something actually blows up, if your logs are just full and full of like crap from things that you don't really care about, it's gonna be so much harder to find the real meat, the real the real problem as it's occurring. Yeah. This is this reminds me a bit of we were talking about this before with uh, Gene Kim's kind of three ways of thinking yeah, about DevOps, yeah. this second way of amplifying these feedback loops. So the stuff that actually matters is actually telling you something useful, that's the stuff you should be seeing, not yeah. not the stuff that is not going to be actionable. Or, right. Yeah. And I think it's important to figure out how to get that. Like That's not a, a thing that you do only when systems are blowing up. That's mm -hmm. like you're carefully crafting your monitoring, your observability story all the time yeah. to, um, to see the things that are the most important when they happen. So for, an, for example, whenever an error happens in TrackJS, either on our client side or on our server side, mm -hmm. we route them all into our main team chat log. Right. Like, like we don't have like 10,000 channels, we're a pretty small team, we have one channel. Uh -huh. And when things blow up, it shows up right there in line. And it forces us to make a decision right then and there, like, is this important? Do we need to like take action and like, contact this user or address this exception or do we actually have a bug? Mm -hmm. Or is this like, oh, somebody hit us with you know, a bad browser or somebody hit us with a bad request. In which case, we need to go into our system and change our logging so that we don't care about these things anymore. Right. And so that we know that whenever something is popping into our chat log, because we've been grooming it like this for so long, 
something is happening. And it's like the fastest alert. I don't have to go check something somewhere else. It's yeah. not something happening out of band. It's right there in the thing we're all looking at all the time. And that shortens that feedback loop, right? Yeah. The, the time to fix is, yeah. is shorter because you're not getting all this noise. And time to fix is like super valuable. Mm. Like uh, we have errors in TrackJS occasionally, right? Like mm -hmm. something slips through to production and our audience are developers. And so when our, uh, one of our customers will find a bug and they'll report it to us or maybe we'll have caught it in our own monitoring kind of thing. Yep. We'll see it right away. We'll be able to like respond and fix it and push it back out there and write back to them and be like, hey, thanks so much for this. We've already fixed it and it's released. Let us know if you have anything else. And those are some of the most valuable, longest retaining customers that we have. Yeah. Just because they're like, wow, you like listened to me and responded to me and like you're a real person doing something to fix my problem. And that's amazing. That's such a, a powerful way of like connecting with developers and, and just being good at you know, yeah. shepherding your systems. And it's kind of putting your money where your mouth is, right? Your your product is, is production monitoring, and if you're not monitoring your production yourself, then... You gotta, you gotta dog food your own stuff. Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it sounds like, like making sure that this monitoring is surfacing the things that you care about and the things that are actually actionable, that's gonna change the way that you write these tests and these monitoring tools and things like that, like what you're actually monitoring, right? Yeah, so testing is like that first level, right? It's before mm. you've really pushed it all the way out. You're gonna write tests. Ultimately, you're, you're testing to give yourself confidence in the system yeah. and to test out the things that are scary or risky. I like to think about testing as addressing risk in your product or your project or whatever. Okay. And so if there's a risky thing of like, oh, what if the database falls over? You should probably write a bunch of tests that like test how the database interacts. Like if that's the thing that's scary, mm -hmm. don't worry about like, oh, we have more integration tests than unit tests. No, if the thing that's scary is integration, yeah. you should have a really good set of integration tests for your project. And I think that's the thing that a lot of testing conversation misses. It's, it's not like how many unit tests to integration tests to system tests you should have. Mm -hmm. It's where is the risk in your project and what are you gonna write to address your specific, um, your specific like cross section of risk. Right. So an example, um, one of the things that I work on with TrackJS is the agent code, okay. and so it's this little bit of JavaScript that we put in other people's pages, and it has to run at a very low level on top of all these different browsers. Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest risks of that is that it doesn't work correctly in a given browser. Yep. And so we have a ton of tests where we are using like browser automation to drive it in all these different browsers and mobile clients with different versions of Angular or Ember or React or whatever on top of them and make sure that everything works. And I have way more of those tests than I actually have unit tests for this agent because that's where all the risk is. I, don't, I need to know that this actually works in Safari 7, yeah. not in my pretend version of Safari 7. That's, yeah, and that's an interesting point and something that I, I haven't seen too much in a lot of teams. They're like, well, we need the code coverage up to whatever percent, which means we put a unit oh, test around it. Code I thought, I coverage. I thought that would be a trigger word. Um, yeah, so uh, like those kind of metrics, what, uh, vanity metrics, they're not actually doing any good? I wouldn't say that they're, they're doing zero good, but like I'm generally very suspicious of any organization that tracks them that like keeps a, a, a like a really good idea of like we're at 100 percent we got to be at 100 percent yeah like you don't need to test 100 percent of your code like a lot of code is framework code it's boilerplate code it's mm. like yep true equals true <laughs> that will <laughs> always that will always be the case we don't need to test that line yeah you need to test the lines that are like oh this is kind of a weird algorithm i don't i don't know that this works every time or I need to test the thing about like, well, if this database schema like changes, this whole thing is gonna blow up. Yeah. You should probably test that against like a real database schema and see that that, that works. Right. Um, code coverage is like this, it's like a, it's a proxy, but you can fake it so easily. So as soon as you start tracking that you have to hit a code coverage number, it's so easy for developers, especially ones that like aren't actually, you know, invested in it uh -huh. to be like, eh, I can just write, you know, I can just call every function in a try catch handler and not assert anything and yeah. hit my hit my code coverage numbers, but you haven't tested anything, right? Like yeah. it's you're just you're going through the motions to hit code coverage. Yep. So that these these tests these are the ones that you run kind of ahead of time to, yeah. to give you a bit of confidence and yeah. so on. But then would you run those same tests in a production system or would you do do things no, differently? In I don't production? think I would run the tests necessarily in production, because that mm -hmm. could create like 
noisy data or stuff like that. Sure. Okay. Um, generally, once it hits it's to a production environment, I'd make sure I have the right monitoring and observability tools there, so mm -hmm. that when things happen in production, as the users are actually doing it, I get those alerts, uh, those alerts or exceptions or whatever coming back to us, and that should feed back into your dev cycle. It's like right. if this happened, that was a miss. It was something that was a real risk, but you didn't address it out with testing right. because it happened. Yep. And so that's a really powerful data point of like, there is a bug here that happened in a real world use case. This is probably like the most valuable like piece of data, a, a piece of, uh, of, ugh, of risk in yep. your system uh, that you should address either with testing or by refactoring that code or uh, but by making sure you have really fast monitoring on it if you can't actually get rid of it. Yeah. And if you don't have that monitoring, you don't know what the Yeah, then you just is. don't know. Then stuff is just blowing up silently in production, mm -hmm. and you're just like, well, whatever. I have 100% code coverage. Everything's great. I shouldn't have any bugs. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> uh, so if people wanted to look a little bit more into this stuff, are your slides for this event online, or is there a recording that we I'm can I'm not watch? sure if there'll be a recording, um, but the slides of it should be online. I'll have a link to it off of my personal website, uh, okay. Todd.mn. We'll, we'll link to that as well. Cool. Yep. Cool. And then uh, if you want to do monitoring and you're writing JavaScript, <laughs> I mean, I can I can help you out there with Track.js. Nice. Awesome. Thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, hopefully have changed a few minds about some some of those things testing. I, I hope so. 100% yeah. test code coverage should should go away. <laughs> that should not be a goal. <laughs> there you go. You heard that heard that here. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, join us next time for another DevOps Lab.